All righty. Okay, welcome everybody. This is uh, our usual uh, Tuesday afternoon, 2 p.m. Central weekly deeper dive series. Today's topic is vulnerability assessment versus a penetration test. In case you've never been here before, my name's Tom Kirkham. I am founder and CEO of Iron Tech Security and Iron Tech's marketing director, Kenzie Haynes, is here with me as well. Say hi, Kenzie. Hello. <laughs> so anyway, we're real kicked back on these and uh, just real casual. We kind of it, it, it sometimes these are topics that are part of the big webinar, right? That we take a, you know, what's an EDR or what does security uh, awareness training look like? Or let's go on the dark web and see what the bad guys are buying and selling and doing, right? We did that one one time. I'd have to do that again. We'll come up with a really good topic to look for on the dark web, something that I won't get a visit from the FBI on. But yeah, we actually went on the, the dark web where you can do what you can see and do and buy all this stuff and where the bad guys hang out lately though we've had a couple of requests for pen test or penetration testing and what that is is a very specialized custom test to see what your weaknesses are from hackers and it's in it's it's done by humans now, I know no one is old enough, and it wasn't a big hit at the, the box office, but if you've ever seen the Robert Redford, Sidney Portier movie named Sneakers, that's what Robert Redford's company did. And the opening scene of the movie, or the not the opening, but the beginning of the movie, he goes into a bank, withdraws $100,000, the teller says, if you don't mind me asking, why are you closing your account? And you got to think, this movie's 20-something years old, so it was real money. And uh, he goes, I just don't feel like my money's safe here anymore. Puts it in a briefcase, walks upstairs to the boardroom of the bank, spins the case around, hands the list, and says, here's where all your vulnerabilities are. This is 100000 I just stole from your bank. I need my check. They paid him to hack the bank, to professionally hack the bank and steal money. And he gave them a report so they could take care of those things. And so there's a lot of confusion around that, right? Uh, so what, are, what is the security assessment? What's a vulnerability assessment? And what is the penetration test? And so we're going to take a deeper dive into those things. And maybe we'll have bags of money like these divers have or... Oh, there's a bottle in that one, so I guess they're not going to get rich. Okay. There's basic – now, Iron Tech does three things. And in case you didn't know, we just added pen testing to our list of services, our security stack, as, as those in the know refer to it as. But, but, in the, but in reality, there's really only two things that are really done, you know, that are common amongst – the security industry and number one is a vulnerability assessment and the second thing is a penetration test okay so i'm going to tell you what the differences are so a vulnerability assessment we when we run a vulnerability assessment we have tools that we install on the network and external to the network that are automated and they just run through and they see what's vulnerable, right? So from the outside of a network, we scan your company's IP address, see what ports on the firewall are open, and we detect what services are behind that port. So in the non-geek speak terms, we know that port 25 is part of email. So we'll see if you've got an email server in your building, which you probably shouldn't, but you might. Um, we'll see port 25 is open, and then we'll discover the service behind it, and we'll get the version number, and then we'll see if it's been patched. And we just report that in a vulnerability assessment, right? Port 25 is open. This is the service that's on it, and here's what version it's on. Uh, vulnerability assessment doesn't put things in context. So it's more likely to produce a false positive. For example, just 
because you have port 25 open and there's a mail server behind it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It's just itemized on the vulnerability assessment. It's just this port is open, just like port 80 is open on your network. No matter what, port 80 is open. You've got to have port 80 open on your network or you can't get on the World Wide Web. And there's other ports too, 443 and... You might have port 21 open, things like that. And there's there's actually six, over 65,000 ports that could be open. I'm, you know, I'm just talking about the 20 or 30 or so that's, that's common. Remote desktop, the default port for it's 3389. So if we discover 3389, we can log into it and see if we can, as a pen tester, see if we can remote access that device. Vulnerability assessments do not consider security measures. So in the case of a remote desktop, in this day of COVID, we set up hundreds of remote desktops for in about two weeks, three weeks tops. And we had to open ports up from to the outside world so they could remote access their desktop inside the office from their home. And we don't do 3389, although I don't think it really matters anymore. It's just what we do. We will do a different port number that's not used by anything else. <clears throat> and uh, so the vulnerability assessment will show that, oh, well, this port 9000 is open and there's RDP behind it. But it doesn't take into the security. It doesn't take in the other security measures that we've put in place for that remote access. And, and we do put very serious security measures in place. But nevertheless, it's gonna show up on a, on a vulnerability assessment because it's an open port, a non-standard open port. So consequently, these vulnerability assessments, they're, they're really a, a technical report. They're, they're not, they're, it's like something you may give to the manager or the president or the owner and it's just like a bunch of gobbledygook, right? He doesn't have any context, he doesn't, he can't take this technical analysis and determine a risk unless he is an expert at InfoSec or at least has some sort of knowledge of IT. Uh, so it has no guidance, it has no context, and it, it's just really a technical report of what's vulnerable. Inside the network, it may show some things that he can action on like password complexity or other password policies. You know we. A vulnerability assessment will pick those up, but generally speaking, it's just a technical report, and it certainly doesn't tell you what to do next. And then finally, vulnerability assessments aren't, are generally not accepted by third parties. It does a third party no good to get a vulnerability assessment if they don't have context. So, for example, if you're required to be PCI compliant, you take credit cards, you store credit cards, things like that. Vulnerability assessment's not going to get you there. Uh, you've got to be PCI DSS, which means you've got to have pen testing done. So pen testing is accepted by third parties because it's got context and it, and it allows for um, uh, other security measures that you can't see simply by doing a vulnerability assessment. Now, the good news about it is a vulnerability assessment is the very first step of a pen test. And what I mean by that is you've got to do a vulnerability assessment before you do pen test. You have to. And in fact, the right way to do it is you do your vulnerability assessment, you look at everything, your, your security, your InfoSec guy, such as IronTech, looks at everything on there, and then they put it in context, and then they offer guidance, and then they put technical, administrative, and physical controls in place to address things like remote desktop access security that the vulnerability assessment reflects, that this is a possible problem, okay? And then you do all of that stuff long before you do a pen test. You're wasting, because pen tests are expensive. I think... Uh, what's our cheapest one? Uh, it's like four thousand, three thousand, three or four thousand dollars, I think. And vulnerability assessments are like fifteen hundred. Okay, and you can do those more than once a year. I mean, you can do them every six months or every three months, even. 
and, and they're automated. So they just, they just run and do their thing and spit out a few pages of a report. Uh, pen tests are something that you may only have to do once a year or just once even, depending on what your third-party compliance wants you to have. And, and if you're subject to HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, it basically, if you're in health, finance, uh, law doesn't have it, but if I was a law firm, I would do pen testing. Um, water utility, you're not required to. I think that's tragedy uh, but it depends on what industry you're in you may or may not be required to uh, do pen testing so so what is a pen test so a pen test remember the vulnerability assessment if i were a pen tester i will take that vulnerability assessment and look for things that i can directly attack using my skills, resources, and knowledge to directly attack and see how far I can get in. So in the case of a remote desktop port, oh, this company's got 20 ports open for remote desktop. They got 20 people that's working in their homes remoting into the office to do work during these COVID days. I'm just going to launch an RDP session and, and go right into that port and get to the login screen. And then I start doing, I might do some, uh, and, the, and the, this varies depending, you, you define a scope of a pen test, right? How far and how much are you willing to pay to go as deep as we can, right? So I may do a dictionary attack on the username and password, may even get a list of employees, you know, off the website or something like that. Sometimes RDPs, they store the username. So I'm already halfway there. All I need is a password. So I just throw a dictionary attack on it and see if I can get in. If I'm successfully, if I get into that remote desktop, it failed a pen test, and now I've got access to the entire network. Uh, but, however, if they hit multi-factor authentication, like we put on our clients, they will not be able to get in. So a human that is a white hat cyber attacker does his best to get inside that company to see what a bad guy might be able to do. Then during the process, we've got this whole list of vulnerabilities, like, like really low uh, security maturity. Like they, they share, they're known to share passwords and they don't use password managers and there's sticky notes that I can see just by looking in the front window of the accounting office that's on the monitors with a pair of binoculars. And, or I walked in their office and just wrote them all down when I was in there when nobody was looking, right? So you, you put all these things in context, you know, that you're vulnerable. You know, I know you're vulnerable with having sticky notes on your monitor, but if no, if the public can't see it or even get to it and no one else can see it, no one else even in your office can see your credentials, then it's a lot more secure, right? It's still a bad idea, but it is more secure in that environment. So a good penetration test is going to determine the business impact of vulnerability. Like, is it, is it really something the remote desktop ports open that we got to worry about? No, because we put all these other security thing, things in there. Like I said earlier, before the pen test actually occurs, what is the scope of this pen test? And that is based upon what are the tools, techniques, resources of the most likely threat actor and the most likely type of attack to occur to this particular type of business. And then, and then you work your way backwards, right? So if you have intellectual property and you're a Fortune 100 company, you're going to be looking at a $100,000 pen test because you need to broaden the scope of what all you're searching. And you're going to put a team of pen testers on it to, that all have differing skills and they bring something different to the table to really crack in there. It might be a half a million dollars or a million dollars, whatever it is. It, you, the scope defines that, right? If you're a small company, four or five people in an accounting firm, 
you primarily do individual tax returns and very small businesses, no in deep financial stuff and things like that. Your attack surface is much smaller, just simply because you've only got four or five computers, but you also are less likely to get hacked by a nation state or a hacktivist. Whereas a Fortune 100 company, they got to assume nation states, hacktivists, terrorists, and criminal syndicates are all gunning for them. A penetration test will also recommend remediation, which I misspelled there, but when they get done and they got in there, they're going to say, okay, you need to do this, you need to do this, and you need to do this. A vulnerability assessment will not do that because, once again, it doesn't have context or guidance. <clears throat> and pen tests usually satisfies third-party requirements properly conducted. So what does Iron Tech do? And, and because we, we're always, if you watch any of our webinars, and maybe at the end of this one I have one, but we talk about a security and risk assessment or risk and security assessment. Because we've done this for so long, we know, and, and because of most of the type of, types of clients that we have, we understand that what you really need is just a, a high level, just a security and a risk assessment. So the owner or the president understands the risk that he has and what he needs to do to dramatically improve his posture. Now we've got clients with 75, 150 employees and, and things like that. We don't do high level on those. We do the vulnerability assessments and, and we will be doing pen tests now that we have that in our security stack. But for most of our clients that are under say, and, and it depends on how much money. Now you can have 10 people and, you, and you're a $50 million company, right? So in general, if you're 15 or 20 employees or, or people, uh, a vulnerability assessment is really about as far as you need to go unless you deal with Department of Defense or you're a specialized law firm you deal in investments, um, you're a VC firm, because those are typically small, but they deal with billions of dollars or hundreds of millions anyway. Uh, you know, yeah, we're going to do pen test on that. So our first step is a security and risk assessment, or we might skip that and go straight to a, a vulnerability assessment where we actually install software. And, and do some scans and stuff. And then finally, the like I said, the penetration test. And that's only after we do one or bo both of the ones before this. If we're going to do a pen test, we're going to do uh, both of those before that. We, we will combine the security risk assessment with the vulnerability assessment. And uh, then we'll do a pen test, right? So we're going to do those first two bullet points. We're going to put in all of our tools and techniques and defensive postures, technical administrative controls around password complexity, password management, password managing tools, multi-factor authentication, cybersecurity awareness training. We're going to be diligent on our backups and monitoring the backups and the firewalls and just all of these different things we do to secure our clients from the bad guys. And then once we implement all that stuff and we think we're in really good shape, we're going to go to the client and say, yeah, you might want to do a pen test and see if we missed anything. So we outsource that and we don't influence it or anything else like that. Pen testers are a unique breed. I think it's a fun business. I mean, how else can you get paid for being a bad guy, right? You get to do all the bad guy stuff and you get paid for it without the prison part. Anyway, I just think it's great. So, um, all of this goes hand in hand with the NIST cybersecurity framework. Anyone that's been to any of my webinars, you know I'm a big fan. Identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, right? That's what these assessments and these testings, uh, testing things are, the whole purpose of those is to be, is to have and implement a very, very good framework to make your defensive posture as good as it needs to be 
for you to have acceptable levels of risk. Okay. It, you don't have to spend a thousand dollars a month. If you're a small firm, it can be very inexpensive and dramatically increase your defense posture. <clears throat> But we are going to be compliant with the NIST cybersecurity framework. So to reiterate, small firms, security and risk assessment, if you are running an active directory or a server that centralizes password management on Windows, we probably would rather do a vulnerability assessment because chances are your password administrative controls are bad if you've never had an InfoSec company. If you've only dealt with your IT company, yeah, I, I'll bet you they're substandard and can be easily cracked. Probably just in a vulnerability assessment or the results of a vulnerability assessment. And then finally, we're only going to do a pen test after the NIST CSF is satisfied. That means we've got everything in place. All right, so if you want a security, and risk assessment or risk and security assessment, uh, just give us a call. Um, I don't have my chat window up, Kenzie. If anybody's got any questions, throw it up in chat. We can probably turn the mic on for you. Um, we don't have anything just yet. Oh, I got it. Uh, yep. Uh, there's a link in the chat. Kenzie just put up there to get your security mm -hmm. assessment scheduled. I forgot to put the price on the slide. It's $795. Uh, we frequently run big discounts on that, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, you know, I don't think we've ever sent an email. It's usually in the big webinars that we give that. But if you're part of an organization that has us speak to your organization, there's almost always a special on that security assessment. And if you haven't had us speak to your organization, uh, let us know. We'd love to do it. We do it all the time. I think we're doing about uh, three this week, aren't we? Yep, we are. Looks we like we do. Have, we do have a question from Daniel. Uh, what do you recommend for local governments? Oh well, it's it's really the same, Daniel. Um, are you? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, it's, it depends on the size, you know. It, well, first of all, we got to go through city administrator or you know mayoral form of government, um, you know, what utility, what departments do you have? How many total employees are part of the same network? Uh, if you basically what it gets down to is chances are, if you've got to win, you know, we deal with communities that only have 300 people in it. Okay. So it's when you say, and then we deal with others that have a hundred thousand, but, uh, so a local government, that's kind of a nebulous term. But for the sake of argument, if you've got a server in your office that validates people when they log on in the mornings and you can change their password or their credentials on the server when they forget it, then we would just do a vulnerability assessment first and see where you're vulnerable, get a good idea of what your security maturity is like. We'll do the, the risk assessment too, and then we'll propose the things that you need to put in place and how much it's going to cost to get you where you need to be. So what percentage of companies do you think have done vulnerability testing? Uh, not nearly as many as they should. Uh, pen testing is another one. Uh, for example, does a big company like Caterpillar do it regularly? I would certainly hope so. It's not something that is published. And as far as I know, I haven't seen any research on it, but that, that is a good question. Um, I, you know, it's one of those things that I'm not sure I would want to tell everybody we ran a penetration test. And it's not that I'm worried or embarrassed by something that we failed. It's just the very fact that there is a report that exists in at least two organizations' networks that has the results of the pen test. So if I was Caterpillar and I bragged to all the investors or the public that Caterpillar 
just went through the most wicked, severe pen testing, and we passed with flying colors, and it was conducted by Dewey, Lynchum, and Howe. I have just told the Chinese where they can hack and get our vulnerabilities and the results of the pen test. So um, what industry sector is leading the parade on testing? Well, healthcare, since they finally put teeth in HIPAA and they actually find people and don't give them a slap on the wrist, uh, they realize that this could be serious money and practices can go out of business. Uh, financials, financial industry, they do pen testing. When, you, when you're dealing with billions of dollars, you have to do everything you can to prevent from being hacked. Uh, presumably, national governments, state governments, um, uh, all the departments of defense, military, uh, all of those are going to do pen testing. <laughs> and, and, they, and they may be a victim of uh, pen testing they didn't, well, in fact, they are uh, a victim of pen testing they didn't pay for because that's pen testing is the only difference between a, a pen tester and a hacker is what do they do when they get in? Now, the criminals in the nation states, they're going to do some illegal stuff. They're going to steal money or intellectual property or do military espionage. The pen tester is going to say, here's how I got in. Here's what you need to fix. I just want the money we agreed to from the get-go. That's the only difference. The only difference. They all use the same tools and techniques for the most part, right? There's Kali Linux that you can download for free that's got all these pen tests in it. There's Nessus. That's a commercial software package that does pen testing. And then they use their own skills like, you know, oh, well, they use, uh, they gather intelligence, right? They get a list of the employees and then maybe they know their hours. They know their company's public IP address. That's easy to get. Uh, they do some manual, good old fashioned shoe leather, as they say in the private eye world. But anyway, Daniel, getting back to your question, uh, just start with our security and risk assessment. And then if, we, if you need a vulnerability assessment, we'd be happy to do that for you. We, the, uh, the, if you pay for the security and risk, risk assessment and only that assessment, we will apply whatever you paid to that to any, um, any of our products and services going forward. So the, the vulnerability assessment, it's straight up whatever the price is, and same thing on the pen test, regardless of whether you're a client or not. Uh, but even the security and risk assessment, you have actionable things, you have a report, you get to understand what your risk is and uh, what you need to do at a very basic level. And if you're a small local government and you've never done any of that, you're going to dramatically improve your security. I mean, dramatically. You're going to go from a wing and a prayer thinking you're too small to be attacked, which no one is, or no one's ever heard of your little town like Toad Suck, Arkansas. The only people that's heard of Toad Suck is people in Arkansas, right? There's actually two Toad Sucks. Did you know that, Kenzie? I did not. I, I, there's Booger Holler, too. <laughs> <laughs> Population seven and one coon dog. Now, I'm perpetuating our Kansan hillbilly myths all of a sudden. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, we do have the, the world's largest retailer, very technologically sophisticated here. So, we're not all, uh, we don't all have coon dogs. And a whole bunch of Fortune 500 companies are here. Anyway, uh, getting back to <laughs> Daniel's question, just get a, just get a uh, security assessment scheduled. Uh, click on that link. And, uh, and just get something scheduled. If you don't move forward with it, it's no obligation. We won't charge you anything. But we can tell you a little bit more about it and kind of feel out where you are too because we want to make sure that you're getting what you need for where you're at in cybersecurity defense, okay? So any other questions? Do we have a topic for next week, Kenzie? Um, we do, and it is how to lead a cybersecurity culture. Mm. Yeah. I've been, we've been postponing that. We have. Mm. 
this is really good and it's probably going to bore everybody to death, but it's going to be very, very important. And we're going to talk about the difference between management and leadership when it comes to cybersecurity practices. So be sure and sign up for that. And, and these are things that you can do without spending a penny. Okay. You can do it better by, by spending just a little bit that everybody on this webinar has the budget for, but you will have things you, just like all of our webinars, you can walk away with things that you can do to help your security out without spending any money. I think that's a bad idea. Um, you, you, there's just a limit to how far you can take that. If you, if you do not have an EDR installed on your network, you're a ticking time bomb. You know, you you guys have probably heard me preach about security awareness training and uh, making sure your backups are monitored and checked to make sure they're actually working when you need them, which most people don't do. But if you do nothing more than replace your antivirus with an EDR, you're going to dramatically improve your security posture. And we're talking $50 a month for five computers. $600 a year. Now, I want you to think about what you paid for cybersecurity insurance or what you're thinking about paying for cybersecurity insurance because that's just easy, right? I don't need to know all this InfoSec uh, abbreviations and know about nation states and APTs and EDRs and SIMs and DNS filtering. I don't need that. It's just all confusing to me. I'll just get cybersecurity insurance and we'll be good. That's the last thing you want to rely on. Just like homeowner's insurance, car in I don't go drive like a maniac because I got car insurance. I don't play Russian roulette because I have life insurance. The same thing with cybersecurity insurance. You put the protections in place, just like you're going to fix your bad wiring in your house so it don't burn down and become a threat to your lives and your family. Put the cybersecurity stuff in place so if you've got, if you're part of critical infrastructure, you don't poison your customers or you're able to deliver water. If you're not damaging your equipment, your pipes, you're not getting your, in any other business you're in, you're not letting credit, your customers' credit cards get out into the wild. That's a big business, stealing credit cards, by the way. It's a, in fact, it's got so many subspecialties, I could probably do a deeper dive just on the credit card theft business or identity theft. We can add that to the list. Well, you know, that would be a good one to go on the dark web with. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, show up for next week, and we'll, we'll talk about those things, you know, what you can do to be a good security leader in your organization. See you next week. Thanks for attending. Thanks, everybody.